This is a story of luck, desperation, trying to save money, and finally, success. Our goal was to make liquid microjets of liquid ammonia and liquid ammonia with alkali metals dissolved in them. Now, this is a pretty harsh task on several fronts. Firstly, these materials are horrific to work with. Uh, they're fairly cold, you know, cryogenic-ish type temperatures, minus 30 is when liquid ammonia liquefies. And they can be fairly chemically corrosive in that all the alkali metals dissolved in liquid ammonia attack chlorinated and fluorinated polymers like crazy, which basically means no PTFA. So we wanted something that would be easy to make, cheap, and reliable. Now our journey started with some off-the-shelf traditional solutions for things like liquid water microjets. So these are commercial microliquids jets. They cost a, a few hundred dollars and they're very precise. And whilst they'll make nice microliquid jets, uh, they're expensive, they're difficult to plumb in. And the plumbing actually requires quite a lot of mass in terms of plastic sleeves, metal jackets to screw it all together and so on. The bottom line is there was way too much thermal bulk there, considering we would have to keep this all cool by pumping a milliliter or so of liquid ammonia through this thing per minute. Now our key problem here was these jets are very prone to blocking. And that's a complete nightmare. Not only in that if the nozzles cost a few hundred dollars a piece and when they block, they're almost impossible to unblock. But if you've also got a big reservoir of liquid ammonia behind this under a few atmospheres of pressure, eh, it's, it's difficult. Now we did try all sorts of things like putting filters before these commercial nozzles but none of it seemed to work. The nozzles always seemed to block within a few minutes of starting the run, which was just a complete non-starter. So out of desperation, we needed to get the nozzle as close to a filter as possible. So this was the solution that we came up with in the end. It's a simple syringe filter, which costs a, a few dollars, and it's mounted directly behind a hand-pulled nozzle. And then it's just melted together. And with a little practice, they're fairly easy to make they start 100% of the time, and you can make them pretty much to any diameter you want. Now we found the best mix for our solutions here was about 100 microns in size, for which we only needed a pressurization on the system of about two atmospheres to get a nice jet, which is fantastic because all of this lower lock stuff goes up to about 10 atmospheres and none of it was remotely phased by the liquid ammonia or the liquid ammonia with alkali metals dissolved in them. So, how do you make these nozzles? Good, so that's sort of what you want to start off with, is about five millimeter tube of glass, doesn't really matter what it is, because uh, we will be drawing it down. And you need to get some oxygen in there, or a silicate glass. And it's fairly fiddly, obviously, working with something this small um, but it, it, it's simple enough, it doesn't take that much practice. Uh, so you just need to melt it up, push a little to make it thicker, 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 thicker. Good, bobify. Good, a little bit of a little bit of a pole, and just let it contract under its own viscosity. That's nice, that's nice, almost there. Almost there, when it's just about to close, so it's about there, you just pull. Nice and gentle pull until it actually solidifies. Pretty good. Now you've got to round off the back side so you can actually mount these things in um, the syringe filter. Uh, you need to sort of melt it on the back side, give it a bit of a pull, let it contract down a bit. Oh there, that's perfect. You've got a little teardrop thing. Yeah, you can maybe thin them out a bit in the middle. And then you just need one on the other side. So, obviously it takes a little bit of practice, but after that, it's really not that difficult. That's about perfect. Okay, there you go. 
Super. Done. There I've got a calibration slide under a microscope, and that's one millimeter there. Probably the easiest metric that you can use uh, for sort of calibrating if you don't have a calibration slide. The human hair. So there's your typical human hair who clocks in at just under a hundred microns, that sort of thing. So those are probably the the easiest things to use uh, as benchmarks for this. You know, generally you don't actually greatly care. Um, there you go. There's a human hair. So there's a hundred microns. And we want to slice this guy. Uh, somewhere around that. So you need to get your. You're gonna need to have to put a scratch on here at about the right distance, at about the right position. Who I reckon is gonna be about. There. Good. So we've got one nice little scratch on there. So we need to lick that, break it, and now you should find that you have a capillary that's about 100 microns. As you said, like less, it's about 50. Cool. That's all there is to it. Then of course you're just going to cut off the rear end, scratch on the back as well somewhere about there. And you're just going to lick that, oops, and just break it like that. And there you go. That's basically the guts of a fairly decent microjet. I'm just going to lick that and break it away from me. Up there somewhere. And if you're keen, you can always clean it up a little. Like so. Good. And then, of course, you just want to do the same thing on the back side. So, single scratch, break it away, and there you have a nozzle ready to go. So, those are the syringe filters that we use. These are actually polyethylene, these, which worked out uh, the best for the chemically corrosive stuff that we were using. So, it has to take low temperature. These things will take low temperature. It's going to take moderate pressure. These things are rated up to about 10 atmospheres. Lower lock here are typically rated up to about 10 atmospheres, which is pretty decent. So, if you've got the filter here and the nozzle here, obviously, there's not many places where the nozzle can pick up crap. So, first thing you're going to do, I'm going to clean that off as best as I can. Get all the grease and of your fingers and such like off. And I'm just going to ease them out. Up there, that's not too bad. Here comes the tricky bit. And this on the oops. Turn this on the camera view, it is super tricky. In the first instance, I'm just going to melt it a little just to tack it on. There it is melting. If you're doing this with your eyes up close, you can actually do this really well. Doing it like this is tricky because I've just no depth perception. 
I'm doing it like that. There we go. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's nice. So at that point, I'm going to focus up close. And you see it sort of... Good. So at that point, I'm going to focus up close so you can see that it's all melted the polyethylene and it's gone all clear. At which point, you can just strain it up in the nozzle. And then you just wait for it to cool. And it takes a few seconds for it to cool. You'll, see, you'll, you'll know when it's solidified because it'll go opaque again on the stalk here. So now you have a filter uh, directly on to a, a nozzle. And these we've happily run up to five bar. And at that point, there's just no point in running them any higher because <laughs> it's it fit for purpose of that. And we, we've never really had these things fail. They've got a very high uh, success ratio. Cool. So that's basically how you make these uh, integrated nozzle filters. And they're dirt cheap to make, of course. It's the cost of the filter, which is, you know, a couple of bucks or something. The cost of the glass, which is essentially zero. And they work... Well, we've never really had one of these not start. They don't really have a clog. Um, so, yeah, they're absolutely fantastic. And when I say resistant to corrosion, I really mean it in that these things I've actually used to make microjets of liquid sodium potassium alloy. So this might seem like a bit of a weird video. I mean, really, how many people have an interest in making uncloggable microjets? Well, this cute little bit of technology is actually at the heart of at least one of our papers in print and a few more upcoming ones. Basically, if you don't know how to do this and have to work it out for yourself, like we did, there's a lot of work in doing this. Simply having a tutorial like this is like striking gold for a half a dozen people around the world. And this really isn't that much of a hypothetical either. We actually had some folks visit the lab the other day, you know, and they wanted to make some microjets like this. So I just showed them how we did it. <laughs> At the end, he very gratefully shook my hand and said, you just saved us six months work. But for everyone else, it's not gold but I hope it's at least mildly entertaining. Because this is what real research looks like. There are no instruction manuals for making something like this. Well, until now, of course. And yes, at some point in the future, I will actually be using these to make the, uh, the world's smallest flamethrower. So if you enjoyed that, uh, drop a like on the video and uh, yeah, I'm sure hit the notification bell to make sure you don't miss out on new uploads like this.